chapter Acts, you kind of read heavily at the beginning, and then you read heavily at the end. But this is these are kind of like the lost chapters in Acts. Matter of fact, most people that know the material in the book, you would ask them questions, and they could tell you about Pentecost, or they could tell you about you know Paul when he went to Jerusalem, and when you know he was bound in the spirit and ultimately went to prison and uh, the prison journey that Paul took to get to Rome, Paul's journey to Rome. But this is sort of like that lost area in Acts. If you're reading through, I don't know if it's this way when you're reading a book, but when I start reading a book, I'm not a person that jumps to the to the end. But in the middle, I kind of, you know, I'm reading along. It better be pretty interesting. And, uh, and toward the end, I'm, you know, usually I've got, to, I think, try to figure out what happens in the book at the conclusion, and then I hold off reading the conclusion just to uh, see if I'm right at the end. And then at the end, I'm always like, why did I bother reading? I was right anyway. It was a waste of time. So I figured out the author's plot right off. The authors are usually predictable. They usually get one good plot they like, and then they put it in every book. Charles Dickens did that. And a lot of people, and so on and so forth. Anyway, here we are in Acts chapter 18, though. And the, the, the important information here, what really ties in, is if you're studying the rest of the Scripture and you're really reading about where the church at Ephesus and the church at Thessalonica and the church at Corinth came from. We're in Corinth. Yes, ma'am. 18 or 16? 18. 18. I was saying 16 through 18. I may have repeated 16. But we are 18. And I think I actually initially announced the correct text this evening. So, hey, that's an improvement, right? So let's go ahead and read it. But uh, this, this, is, this is really the beginning of the church in Corinth. Last week, last week we were at Athens. And Paul was grieved in his spirit because why? What grieved Paul at Athens? Holy, uh, city holy given to idolatry. Yeah, the whole city was given to idolatry. Now, you think that was it was surprising to Paul that people were pagan? You think he was surprised to go to Athens and discover <clears throat> that people were pagan? Was that surprising? No. Not at all. What shocked and bothered Paul was that people were so religious and so wrong about religion. And that was the kind of thing at Athens. It wasn't that it was so much the scholarship and the philosophy that was there. It was that the people were so into God and the philosophy of worshiping God. I'll just tell you something. It's trendy every few years. It's trendy to say there is no God, and then it's trendy to just dabble in worshiping God, whoever He is. You know, you ever wonder about the New Age and the mysticism? That isn't a denial. That isn't atheism. It's just a dabbling, playing with idolatry. Well, here we are in Acts chapter 18. We see where this church comes from. And we really have one concept to learn this evening. It's a simple one. And I trust that we'll learn it simply as it's intended. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean. From henceforth, I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house, whose name named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall hurt thee, for I have much people in this city, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. I just love that, don't you? almost could just pray and have an invitation after reading that text. Before we pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, uh, I want to read verse 15 of Acts chapter 9 when Saul, when Ananias was sent to pray over Saul and to, to bring him in. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me 
to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take nothing away from the Scripture. But Father, I pray that the Scripture would take hold on us tonight. That's our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul's been at Athens. Some devout people, uh, some devout people uh, were saved. Dionysius the Areopagite. Areopagus was that, remember that rock outcropping over outside of Athens where you could see the whole city from it? And so somebody who would have been entrenched in the culture, named after the location, defied the odds and came to Jesus Christ. So Paul left Athens having won people. Remember, he was at Athens because he had uh, had to leave Berea because of the troublemaking Jews from Thessalonica had come to Berea, started a mob, caused trouble for him, and so he left and he was waiting for Timothy and Silas, who came uh, to him at Corinth instead of Athens. But he was waiting at Athens. He's going to the market, he's going to the synagogue, doing what he always does, he's just living. And he was bothered at the idolatry in the city. So he preached the gospel there, and now he's left from Athens and he's gone to Corinth. And the scripture says that he found a place to live. He lived with Aquila and, and his wife Priscilla, and Paul was there uh, carrying out an occupation of making tents. We use that phrase, that term tent maker, to uh, describe a preacher who works an occupation because that's what Paul did. Paul uh, testified in many places in the Scripture and even apologized to the churches for not being chargeable to them, meaning not making them pay for the ministry uh, that he had toward them. So Paul worked as a tent maker. You can argue, oh, a preacher ought to work, you know, they ought to work a, a secular job for a living. Well, Paul did. Uh, you could also say, well, Paul apologized to the church for doing that. So maybe it wasn't read, uh, scriptural or biblical. We do know that the scripture says that the ox that treads the corn, uh, you shouldn't be muzzled. And so he ought to, they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Paul said that as well. So if you're going to use Paul as an example and say, well, a preacher ought to be supported by the ministry, uh, you would be contradicting what Paul said. But if you were to say a preacher should never work to support the ministry, you'd be contradicting what Paul did. And so I hope there's clarity there. I think it's. I think that there were times, don't you, when Paul worked, supported in the ministry, and there were times when Paul worked and supported the ministry. I don't think anyone is qualified to be paid a check from a ministry unless they've supported ministry before they ever got paid. And boy, I, I don't know about it. I, I don't know how you do this, but I think every preacher ought to be a giver to the ministry that he's involved in. If the preacher doesn't give to his own ministry, uh, he probably doesn't love it. And so I think that that's important as well. That isn't anything that's really main information here, but it's funny how a statement that's an aside in the Scripture can become the major doctrine, and the major doctrine can become an aside in reality. And so more people talk about the tent making in Acts chapter 18 than talk about the... Uh, marvelous thing that the Lord did for, for Paul. Okay, so Paul was called specifically, we call him oftentimes the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Now it's interesting when Ananias, though, is here's this message from the angel, from the Lord, that he's told that Paul would be also a messenger to the Jews. But we read in our text tonight that Paul went in verse 4, reasoned in the synagogue in every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Well, it's good. Sounds like things were going well. He's going into the synagogue. Synagogues were public meeting places. And uh, if you were Jewish, synagogue was a Jewish place that uh, you, today, you actually have to pay pay a fee to belong to. It's sort of, you know, one of those countrymen fees. It's sort of like, I don't want this to be taken wrong, but a synagogue in many ways for a Jewish person is like a country club. In other words, it's what you're joined to for fraternity and contacts and your social aspect of life and so forth. And that's uh, If you don't understand where Jews are coming from when they're attached to a synagogue and yet they don't believe anything, that's where they're coming from. It's a country club for them. It's a social gathering where they meet with people that are like themselves coming from where they're coming from and they can relate to. And so it's also why you can't just walk into a synagogue 
and uh, have a say or speak there or whatever, they'll throw you out because you're not a member. You didn't pay. You want to talk? You want to go to a synagogue and uh, have a say? You need to pay your five thousand dollar upfront fee and then your monthly dues. And I don't know many guys that want to preach in synagogues that have invested that way, and so they're probably less successful. It could be just because they're too cheap to pay to preach the gospel. Now, I know there's a little more to it than that. I'm not trying to trivialize or anything like that. But I'm just throwing something out there for your interest, if you're interested in thinking about it. But see, now, Paul in verse 6 dealt with unbelief. In verse 6, it says, When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. <clears throat> That's a rather emphatic statement, is it not? Do you think here, and I don't want I don't want to try to play the Holy Spirit or be God or judge the heart of somebody. But do you think this is a spiritual high point for the Apostle Paul? Some people are shaking their head no. Do you think it might be a spiritual low point for the Apostle Paul? Do you think it might be a time of discouragement for Paul? Might he be disgusted with the results of the investment he's made in the ministry? Did you say yes? Well, folks, wake up. It's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We're rushing, trying to get out of here so we can you know, do whatever it is you do after you rush out of church. Uh, is Paul at a down point? Is he at a low point in his life? When he says to the people, you can go to hell if you want to. I'm innocent. I tried. You didn't receive it. I'll go talk to the Gentiles. They'd rather hear it. I'd rather go to Antioch and preach. The last three cities Paul has been in, he has been in Thessalonica, Berea, in Athens, the Jews threw him out. They caused trouble for him, made such a stir that he got kicked out. Yes? I was going to say no, because God told him he was going to go to the Gentiles. Well, I, okay, so if you're following when we began, we read the whole of verse Acts 9.15, and the last statement is that he would be, and also to the Jews. Read it. Look it up. I read it just a minute ago, so you have to do due diligence. Look it up while we're doing this. What is it? Uh, Acts 9.15. Okay, so we read that at the beginning of the message. Um, okay, so the last three cities that Paul has been to, he has been basically, I mean, in Athens, he's trying to keep a low profile, and just because of the idolatry there, he got upset and started preaching the gospel. But he's had problems everywhere he's been, and who's caused the problems? You know, I think, I think Berea was the tipping point. The Bible says they were more noble, the Bereans were, because they searched the scriptures and see if the things were so. So here Paul is preaching at Berea. The Bereans are finding out whether it's true. They're becoming believers. And then the troublemakers from Thessalonica came over and stirred up people in Berea and got Paul kicked out of Berea. I mean, it wasn't as though they were passive. kind of reminds me of the way Paul was when he got letters from the high priest and went to Damascus to bind Christians and bring them to prison. Now, these Jews that are opposing him are as tenacious and nasty about it as he was in persecuting Christ before he was born again. And guess what? Paul, if anybody, ought to be able to understand persecution. But I'll just tell you something. Paul was human. He was human. And you and I can talk about, you know, should Paul have been down? Should he have been discouraged at this point in life? But the reality of it is that the perspective you and I come from is that as far as I know, none of us have been beaten uh, have rocks thrown at us and left for dead. How many of you have had rocks thrown at you until literally the rock chuckers thought you were dead? Anybody ever been in prison and beaten until almost dead? You ever been in prison and literally put into the most secure part of prison and had shackles put on you to where you couldn't move and have the outcome be, first of all, that it was illegal that you were in prison because you were a Roman citizen, you'd been beaten, you were untreated, you had wounds on your back and you're sitting down in filth and and, and grime, and you're illegally in prison? Have they ever been illegally in prison? None of us have. Most of the things we've suffered have been a result of our own bad, uh, our own bad intentions or our own bad actions, right? But Paul's been through a tough time. It's a tough point in his life. Has Paul seen high points in his life? Yes. Yeah. I mean, 
just a few short years before when Paul was preaching the gospel, people would come and touch a garment that he'd worn and be healed. I mean, it was... I mean, the things that were happening were just so amazing. And, and Paul, not to compare him with Jesus, but Paul had that popularity phase in his ministry, much like Jesus did, before he made that grand entry into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. This is not Paul's high point in the ministry. Paul is waiting, waiting at Corinth for Timothy and Silas to come to him because they're still stuck back at uh, Berea. They're going a roundabout way. Paul can't really preach openly. And then he goes into the synagogue and people start to hear him. And then all of a sudden, troublemakers start coming in, stirring things up. And Paul said, enough of you. I'm tired of, I'm tired of Jews. Every time I preach the gospel to you, you oppose your own selves. You think, do you think I preach the gospel to you because I'm in danger of damnation? You're the one going to hell. You're the one that your decision is literally going to have eternal consequences and you're treating me, who am laboring and contending with you, trying to win you, you're treating me as though I'm causing you problems. And if you want to go to hell, then you just can. And right at that moment, I believe Saul was sideways. Right at that moment, Paul wasn't following the Holy Spirit. Right at that moment, Paul was just making logical decisions to deal with people the way they were dealing with him. And I want us to see this evening, I want us to see the Holy Spirit in the loving way that He restored Paul to love his kinsmen. See, Paul was a Jew. Jew of the Jews. Defended his Jewishness. We read in Sunday school uh, last week in Philippians chapter, is it chapter 3? Philippians 3 or Philippians 2? I think it's Philippians 3. Paul defended and talked about how Jewish he was. And here Paul in Corinth said, I don't, I don't think I'm Jewish at all. I wish I'd never seen a Jew. Wish I didn't know what one was. Because I don't like them. Even if I are one. And so he found a guy to go stay with so he could get out of the problems, to get away from the troublemakers. <clears throat> In uh, verse 7, he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God. And if the Scripture ended there, you know, we could pick up at a missionary journey somewhere else. But the story doesn't end there. Justice's house is adjoined to a synagogue. A Gentile synagogue. No, there aren't Gentile synagogues. Synagogues are where Jews live. And literally, when he's sick and tired of all the Jews, and the last place that he's had trouble with Jews is a synagogue, he goes and stays with Justice, and Justice's house is literally built on to a synagogue. And there was a man there who was the head of that synagogue, and his name was Christmas. Oh, that's a nice name, Christmas. And the Bible says about Christmas that he was the chief ruler of the synagogue, verse 8, he believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Why? Why? Why does Paul go to a synagogue in Corinth and he's working, living with Aquila and Priscilla and he spends his time studying and working and helping Jews to understand that Jesus is Christ and they oppose Him so badly that He decides He doesn't mind if they go to hell. And then He goes to this man's house, Justice, and built on the site of Justice House, or Justice House is built on the site of a synagogue, and there's a chief ruler of the synagogue whose name is Crispus, and he believes in all his house, and everybody gets saved. Why is I mean is it a different city? No, it's both they're both in Corinth. Why? Two reasons. Two reasons, friend. Individuals receive Jesus, not ethnicities. Do you understand that? In other words, individuals come to Christ. If you got saved, you didn't get saved because 
of the ethnicity that you came from. You got saved because you received Jesus as your Savior. And that's a volitional, free choice of the will. And I will say to you, friend, I hope you get it, I hope you remember it, that we are made in the image of God. Not from some stamp of a preformed race. We are in God's image and the decision to reject or to accept God is an individual decision. And just because Crispus was Jewish, Paul would have thought he wouldn't have gotten saved. But just because Crispus was a devout man and loved God with all his heart, he did. And I think that is positively amazing. Don't you? And our country in my lifetime has never been as divided as it is today over the subject of race. Everybody agree with that? I am so sick of people talking about race. I, I hate it. I hate the idea. I hate the idea that somebody is considered something. It matters that he's white, or it matters that he's Jewish, or it matters that he's uh, Hispanic, or it matters that he's uh, that he's African American or black or Haitian or Jamaican. In a country that's supposed to believe in God, people act as though people are made in different images than God's. And I would like it, I would really like it in our country at least, to be that people are human, made in God's image, and not have the concern be about their ethnicity or their background or a stereotype that fits that. But that's a lot of what Acts deals with. And that's what Paul's dealing with. Paul said, you know, I'm done with Jews. They all hate God. Now, what was Paul's ethnicity? Jewish. Jewish. Except for me. They all hate God. And they oppose themselves. And they just make a mockery. And they this, this, and this, and this. Friend, God's not a respecter of persons. And we shouldn't be either. Okay, that's the first point that we're going to get here. You get this tonight? In other words, in the same city, same scenario, in one situation, they rejected Paul and the gospel that he preached. In the same city, in a different scenario, same scenario, different location, they wholeheartedly received Christ. Okay? And so we have to understand that you and I don't preach the gospel on the basis of who it is that we preach to. You get this? Now here's the second thing I want us to understand tonight. Everybody understand the first part? Was we preach the gospel because we preach the gospel. We don't decide, I'm going to preach the gospel of the Jews, or I'm going to preach the gospel of the Gentiles, or I'm going to preach the gospel of the rich, or I'm going to preach the gospel of the poor, or I'm going to preach the gospel to the aged, or I'm going to preach the gospel to the young. We just preach the gospel. And I'll tell you why Paul preached the gospel to Crispus when he said he wasn't preaching to any more Jews. He preached the gospel to Crispus because that's what he was, a gospel preacher. And Crispus was a human. And Paul, how, what do you think happened with Crispus? He saw Paul probably over there at, at uh, Justice's house or whatever, and he said, hey, you look Jewish. I don't even like Jews. What are you talking about? You should come to the synagogue. I don't go to synagogues. I don't like them. We'll come anyway. I don't know what happened. Maybe Paul was just so into getting up on the Sabbath morning and going into the synagogue is what he did. Maybe in the midday. Well, I don't know what time it was he went. It was the evening, wasn't it? Maybe just so ingrained in him to go to the synagogue. He's like, well, I don't like going to the synagogue. I'm just going to go to the synagogue. I'm not talking to anybody. I don't want anybody talking to me. And pretty soon somebody said something to him, but Paul realized I'm a gospel preacher. He preached the gospel. He just can't help preaching the gospel. Friend, if you ever get it ingrained in your mind that you're a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you'll preach Jesus in all circumstances. You know, I remember a day in my life when I would read Romans 1, is it 16 or 18? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation, everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Is that Romans 1, 18? 16, 1, 16. I remember reading that and making that... <clears throat> A, not a for my whole life, but a life verse. Like a, that, that's, that's my aspiration. Not ashamed. When uh, I was in high school in the 1990s, the slogan that all the teenagers were putting on their 
cars and trucks and book bags and notebooks and so forth was no fear. Oh. Everybody remember no fear? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and the preacher used to preach against it in our church. I, I, you don't have any fear, it means you don't fear God. You know, they didn't like it because it was a cultural trend. But everybody had no fear. Our life verse uh, for our senior class was, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We took that verse out of context and used it for our class verse. And, uh, yeah, 2 Timothy, was it 2.15? 1.7? Thank you. <laughs> anyway, at least I know the verse. If I don't know the reference. <laughs> anyway, so no fear. The Romans 1.16, you know, was one of those verses where I think, man, I'm a little scared to preach the gospel everywhere. It takes me a little time, you know, uh, to wind up and get ready to do it. it. Takes me a while to, you know, get over the hesitancy to preach the gospel. But there came a day in my life, Christian, and note this, and I, I think every Christian ought to get there. There came a day in my life when I wasn't ashamed to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I haven't been ashamed since then. In other words, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to preaching the gospel to anybody anywhere. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I have no fear to preach the gospel. I think a lot of what happened was I preached the gospel enough. In other words, I just preached the gospel enough, I realized there's nothing to be afraid of. It's the power of God to salvation. Everyone that believes it. If people get saved, good. If they don't get saved, that's nothing to do with me. It's not going to hurt me. If they don't like me, well, I don't like Jesus. I'm okay. No fear. And that was Paul. See, what Paul said in Romans 1, he actually practiced in Corinth at the synagogue where Crispus was the chief ruler. In other words, he wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I could say, well, Paul was a little bit down spiritually. We'd agree on that, wouldn't we? Paul was probably a little backward, and he actually was a little bit rebellious. See, he said he wasn't going to preach to the Jews, didn't he? And when God called him to preach the gospel, he said, you're going to preach to the Jews. You're going to preach to Gentiles, you're going to preach to kings, you're going to preach to, and you're going to preach to the Jews. And Paul said, I'm not preaching to the Jews. I don't like him. But he's such a gospel preacher that he did. Okay, that's the first point. We're done with it. Second point. God is merciful. God is merciful. <laughs> I don't know if Paul ever read Luke's account, the Acts of the Apostles. I suppose while a lot of these things were happening, Luke was writing it down, but Luke may have sat down in one setting and just written all of Acts. I don't know. I don't know whether Paul ever got to read it or not. But if Paul were to read Acts chapter 18 and he were to read that statement, I'm not preaching to the Jews anymore. And he'd have read the words that he said, documented by Dr. Luke, who was very precise and careful to cite the source and to make sure that he got words document it correctly. And if Paul were to judge himself, he'd say, backslidden bum. What a jerk. I don't even like me. You ever, you, can anybody ever been there? You looked at yourself and you said, I don't like me. <laughs> I don't like that guy. It's me and I don't like him. <laughs> and uh, that's where Paul was. And if Paul were to give an opinion on what God should do with him, I can imagine Paul might say, you know something, God ought to just tell me, that's it. You're done preaching the Jews, you're done preaching. I'm done with you. You don't want to do things my way, I'm God. You forget who I am? You're done. Well, what did God do? God led him to a place where he could preach to Jews that would believe. And then I want to look at what God said. There's no other account of this happening for Paul. Verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the, by, in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. I am telling you, you want to know how long it was since Paul got to stay anywhere? He'd go to a city, he'd preach the gospel, Things would be looking up. Somebody would make trouble. They'd try to kill him. He'd get run out of town. He'd go to a city. 
he preached the gospel. Things be looking up. Somebody would get mad, try to kill him. He'd cause trouble. He'd get run out of town. I don't know how long you've lived where you're at, but most of us need a break sometimes. And Paul had been run helter-skelter from city to city being persecuted. And I'll just tell you something, he was human. And the most amazing thing in the world that touches my heart is that God came to him in a vision and said, Paul, don't be afraid. I've got a lot of people in this city and you're going to be able to be here a while and you're going to be able to preach the Gospel. You just do what you're supposed to do. And God took all these events and just turned them around. And God didn't save Crispus for Paul's sake. You understand what I'm saying? He saved Crispus for Crispus' sake because he received Jesus. But God did save Crispus for Paul's sake. You get this? In other words, God took Paul to a place in the ministry that was just so fruitful and so refreshing that restored him. And that's the nature and character of God. At a time when you would think, you know what, God, I'll be done with me. What do I have to cry about? I deserve to go to hell. I sure shouldn't be, should be, should be bothered by being driven out of Berea and being disliked by people. I was an ogre. I killed people before I was saved. I shouldn't mind people trying to kill me. Well, that's all logical. all makes good sense. It's good reasoning. It's all fair and right. But my friend, we're human, aren't we? We're frail. And Paul was in a place of frailty. Very fragile in this instance. And God loved him, used him, rested him, and restored him. God loved him. God used him. God rested him. And God restored him. God's really good. Christian, I just want to tell you something. You can make it. You can be at a hard point. You can be at a low point when you'd say, you know what, I'm done. I'm fed up. Remember who you're saying you're done to. And remember what you're saying you're done about. If God called you to it, then could I just politely suggest that maybe if God isn't done, you're not either? And that maybe the bad experience isn't all there is to the ministry. And maybe there's some good in it too. That's precisely what the Lord taught Paul. Gave him a year and a half of time in Corinth. God worked mighty wonders there. And we see more about that uh, later on in Acts, and we see more about it as well in uh, the letters to the church in Corinth, the Corinthians. Let's thank the Lord for what we learned tonight. God, thank you so much. Father, You're just able to do what we cannot. Even when we're wrong, even when we don't do what's right, You can still, you can still use us. And you can still turn us and effectively have the Gospel preached. And then God, I just thank You for the sweetness. Instead of just crushing Paul or destroying him or casting him out, Lord, You just restored him and used him. And You rested him. Father, I pray that for those here tonight that need the same, they'd have the same loving experience of you as the same Heavenly Father. We thank you for what you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay.